Ah, uh, best laid plans. If you've seen my initial impressions video on the APOC Tactical Cutlass, I mentioned that I purchased that one first, and then a few days later, because it was on sale, I went ahead and bought my second choice, which is the broadsword. They both showed up on my door on the same day. So my plan was to do back-to-back -back unboxing initial impressions videos. Well, it was still really hot that day. My lighting was terrible. I was having some challenges, apparently, with inconsistent settings on the camera. I don't know how much is the camera software, Windows 11 clashing with those drivers. Not sure yet, but that, that's another issue. And I just didn't feel like what I'd produced was worth putting out there. So gave it some time, played with some things, let the weather get a little bit better. And this is a few days later. So it's not going to be my initial initial impressions, but maybe a more informed initial impressions of the APOC Tactical Broadsword. And I'll do a little comparison to the Cutlass and recapping how I got to this point of thinking about tactical swords as, as part of my collection and training rotation and, well, how it's working out for me so far. So let's, let's go ahead and get into it. All right, starting with build and specs, and then I'll kind of recap my philosophy of use in the handling section and, and give you an update on how it's actually going. I will put up photographs to compare these side by side so I don't have to keep waving two swords around on the screen, but a couple of things to look at right off the bat. We'll start with the scabbards because the builds are very similar in terms of this plastic scabbard with a drainage hole on the end. They're very slim. They both have these frog mountings, but one of the things you're going to see if you look really close is that the cutlass, it's, this fitting is screwed on. Whereas on the broadsword, it's riveted in place. So I haven't really taken a look at what it might take to remove that. It may be on there permanently. This, this could be easily removable. That might be a detail for consideration. Retention, very similar in style, but I had a lot more struggle with this one. And I had, I've had to do some adjustment that I'll talk about in another video to make it, well, removable without, uh, yeah, really fighting it. This one, not so much, just a, just a little bit of practice in and out, and it's, it's managed to be removable with just a, a good tub, okay? It also locks back up with just a little bit of a, a push. Very positive, very much like the butterfly swords. Actually, a little bit firmer. Now, retention is really good and not a lot of rattle. The other thing you might have heard, or in this case not heard, is if you if you watch the video on the cutlass when i drew it in and out of the scabbard there was a lot of scraping and i'm not getting this here i'd suspected some of that was because of the blade shape or maybe the blade's not fitting in that scabbard curve wise just right yeah it's it's definitely dragging on the scabbard in and out this this one is a, is a whole lot smoother so that's that's all good now some interesting things in terms of similarities and differences. They are both 30 inches long overall. They are both 9260 spring steel with G10 grips that are retained with three pretty beefy looking hex bolts. And then things get very, very different between them. Now, one thing I didn't really go into detail with the Cutlass, I mentioned that these are produced by APOC, which is under the Cass Siberia umbrella specifically. They are under the um, Dragon King branding in many cases. So you might see them as Dragon King versus APOC swords. And the, the big thing I didn't mention is that apparently a lot of these designs are by Angus Trim, and I can definitely see his practical, functional aesthetic, and we'll talk about that more in the handling section. But a couple of differences in the two swords that make them, well, very different, very complementary potentially, but a few things to get out of the way. Weight is not a whole lot different. This is actually two ounces lighter. So this is two pounds even, and the cutlass is two pounds too. And I think it's because maybe the cutlass is a little 
thicker at a quarter of an inch at the Ricasso, where this one is 316, so a little, a little shave less. Now, I did detect a slight distal taper in the cutlass. It's harder to figure out on this one because of where the fuller ends, and then you get the diamond cross section. So I'm not seeing a whole lot of distal taper, but there is still some profile taper. Now, this is obviously a wider blade of a completely different profile. The cutlass is a single-edged, uh, saber style design with a big fuller you know it's got some curvature to it in a false edge this is a, a wide double edged blade that has a nice fuller and then where there is a cross section there is a diamond cross section this is an inch and three quarters wide whereas the cutlass was an inch and a quarter wide so it's you know half inch difference in the width of the sword down here Blade length is an inch different. So the Cutlass has a 22 inch blade. This has a 23 inch blade. And I think that is specifically right here in this blunt Ricasso. So you got 22 inches of sharp edge and an inch of non-sharp edge above these really basic hooked quillins, which are enough to protect your hand and keep it from sliding up. Might, might be big enough to catch something. You might be able to stick a finger up here, and we'll talk about grip here in a second, because that's where things get much, much different. The grip on the Cutlass, I was expecting a lot worse, and it's, it's pretty rounded. It's very comfy. I have, since I did that initial review, rounded the edges just slightly. I also did a little fine-tuning on you'll notice this divot up here at the top that's that's where that scabbard retains in a little bit of breaking those corners allowed me to do smoother drawing but yeah it's that one still isn't locking up quite as nice as this one now this one has this overlapping section of tang on what would be the pommel where you've got a lanyard hole it's got a lot of sharp corners. I think obviously some of that design, they're thinking impact tool, but I'm definitely gonna talk about how that affects grip. It also affects grip in terms of length when you combine what's missing here with that extra inch here. Cutlass has eight inches of grip. This has five and a half. So not really able to get a second hand on here. And as I'll talk about in handling, when I try, it's not good. Another thing that's not good, rounded grip scales on the Cutlass, these are really, really, really square. I'll show you some, some close-ups, but this feels like holding a piece of lumber. It is really not comfortable, and after nearly a week, it's not really growing on me much as compared to the Cutlass, which is surprisingly comfy for what it is. So I haven't done it yet, but I plan to very shortly probably reshape these scales and round out these edges for, from you know, my, my delicate hands. And like I said, we'll talk about how that affects handling. Interesting thing. Now... I did mention in the Cutlass review that it came really gunky. The, the oil that it was coated with to preserve it had kind of polymerized into sticky goo, and it was hard to get off. But when I did, I was using a CLP, which was one of my just favorite all-around lubricants, protectants. I got hit in the face with this really strong vinegar smell. Now, this had a nice fresh coat of grease on it. I didn't think I'd, I'd get that. But yeah, when I applied the CLP to strip it off, uh, it's, wow, vinegar. I don't know what the heck it was in terms of a chemical reaction. But once I had the, the coating changed out, that immediately went away. But it revealed a totally different finish. The finish on the Cutlass, it, I would almost describe it as a powder coat or parkerization. It, it strikes me as a very tough and possibly kind of thick matte finish. I haven't seen any, any scrapes or scratches. This one, like the butterfly sword, seems to be a fairly thin DLC. And I've had other reviews that I've read criticize, you know, that the finish is worn away or scratched in spots, just probably from the scabbard. And you can see it down here, you know, around the Ricasso in the base of the fuller. That, yeah, there's, there's some spots that are that are worn away. It's also a somewhat glossier finish, so I, I feel like it can cut better, and we'll take a look at that. Um, edge planes actually are pretty well shaped. Fuller's pretty well shaped. 
I think a little bit better than the Cutlass, where after I cleaned it up a little bit, I noticed some flaws on that fuller. Edge, secondary bevel, yes, not very steep. It has a very, very keen edge, and we'll talk about that in, in just a bit. It, it does have, obviously, just, just a bit more flex than the Cutlass does, because it is a little bit thinner, but it's a reasonably stiff blade and point of balance. The Cutlass, surprisingly, the point of balance is at two and a half inches. It's, it's pretty close to that cross guard. This one's at three and three quarters, so it's further up the blades. Now, that does still put it in the comfort range for what I'm used to with a lot of my swords. So it's not, it's not unwieldy. I mean, it isn't a heavy sword, but I do intend to do a video where, for me, point of balance is, is a huge factor in how a sword feels and handles. If it's too far forward versus too far to the hand, yeah, it can make swords of almost identical lengths and weights feel like completely, completely different weapons and handle like completely different weapons. So for me, a point of balance is huge. And this point of balance, I think, is actually in a pretty ideal spot for combination of maneuvering and, yes, blade presence. So let's talk about handling. All right, have not touched up this edge, and I wouldn't necessarily call it an out-of-the-box edge if you take into account the possibility that rubbing on that scabbard might have dulled it a little bit, but let's, let's see how it's doing on some, well, pretty fine paper. Yeah. That's pretty nice. Well, something with a bit more resistance, a little bit of cardboard. Just, oh my, okay. I'd say that's pretty good. Okay, I'm going to try not to repeat the whole ramble that I gave you in the Cutlass video where I talked about how I got here to the point where I'm thinking adding tactical swords to my collection and my practice seems like a good idea. And I started that conversation by saying I've always had a strong preference, actually a 100% preference, for historic classic designs when it comes to swords, since I started studying traditional swordsmanship. And it's not only the aesthetics, but it's, it's how they feel and how they move when I am learning and training and practicing. Now, I also mentioned that there are certainly other kinds of weapons where I still have that preference for the classic historic design, but I have come to appreciate more modern designs and materials. And when it comes to certain of those tools that I am more likely to everyday carry, yeah, I, I often go for, yeah, that modern, maybe tactical build design. Does that apply here? It seems like that's the intent. But for Mike, no, I, I have no intention. Well, who knows where, where our history is going from here. But right now, I have no intention of carrying a sword as an EDC. I, I might think about putting it to, you know, some limited field use in the yard and see what other kind of utility use it might have beyond being a sword in terms of just being a really big, solid blade. But we'll get to that. Why I'm thinking this would be a good part of my practice? Well, there are certain aspects of these weapons that might be good crossover tools, and I am working on some projects, you know, looking at where HEMA crosses over to some of the traditional Japanese and Chinese swordsmanship. So this could be some good tools because they do have features of both, but they are certainly um, very different sizes. And this is the second reason I've gotten into it, which I found in the last, well, barely a week of handling these, has proven itself out. I mentioned in other videos, I tend to do a lot of my routine, kind of impulsive pick up a sword training in the confines of very small spaces. So having a weapon that is similar in weight and balance to a full size sword that I could use in closer quarters is very appealing for that and this definitely yeah weapons of this size are very useful at sparing you know the furniture and the plants and the lamps and the ceiling and everything else so having something like this around i found 
very useful. And one of the uses I've been specifically putting it to is as I am studying more of the classic masters. I mentioned my pattern. I'll sit down and I'll do the reading and maybe if somebody's got a video version of it, read through that and I'll want to move through it. And in that transition from reading to moving, it's just real easy for me to pick up a smaller, shorter, handier thing to try out some of those movements in combination and just see what it's like before going to a larger space with a longer weapon. So in that sense, very, very handy. Now, I think I picked a good pair because I've got one that it's, well, curved but not excessively curved so that makes it for me function as anything from a, a saber to a japanese style sword it's got a lot of potential and out of the box as i mentioned the grip is pretty comfy balance point really close to the hand so yeah it's it's two ounces heavier than the other one but it's really easy to move around i can comfortably get a second hand on it if i really want to so if i'm practicing any techniques with a two-handed weapon, like, like a Japanese-style sword, and then comparing that to how a one-handed design like a saber moves, it's a quick transition. I don't have to switch weapons. So that's all good. Now, what about this one? Well, Mike likes his straight double-edged cut and thrust sword. So anything that fits in that category serves very well for this weapon. It does have a little bit more blade presence, so yeah, I feel like it's a little bit more of a cutter, but it's, it's certainly not unwieldy. I can move this around and, and change direction, move it into thrusts and parries and blocks and just about anything else I want. It's, it's quite handy. And I can use it like a variety of double-edged straight weapons, whether it's a Chinese gin or an arming sword or a side sword. Even used it for some broadsword backsword techniques. Yeah, it doesn't have the hand protection, but again, I'm just kind of experimenting with moves in a confined space as I continue to study. So just a quick tool I can pick up and move around and not worry about destroying my environment. So that's awesome. Now, I haven't gotten a chance to go out for various reasons and do some actual cutting with them yet. And in this case, I'm reluctant to until I make some upgrades, because this grip is really uncomfortable. But it's uncomfortable in the sense I don't want to do the cutting, because just hitting this against my, my pal stab him, it hurts. <laughs> I don't really want to go out and do any cutting with this until I round off these scales. But a couple of interesting things, because he's just got a couple of choices in terms of how to hold it. Now, it would make sense to potentially, well, grasp it just right up here close to the guard. Could you put a finger up over one of the quillen? Sure, it's sharp edges. Another thing I've noticed with this is if you look at the top of the scale, I could put my thumb over that like a, it's a really nice shelf, finger up or not. Yeah, that, that gives me a very particular kind of security in the grip. There still is a lot of sharp corners digging into me. don't want to really hit anything with it yet. But an interesting thing I noticed. The way this flares out. Now, this exposed piece of steel on the butt end of it. If I try to get a second hand on here, guess where all those sharp corners are? Yeah, right in the palm of my hand. Um, that feels uncomfortable to hold. I couldn't imagine hitting something holding on to it like that. But if I'm doing gen style techniques where I'm just making finger contact with the pommel to help balance or stabilize the weapon, um, I, I could still do that. I'm still running into some sharp corners. But an interesting thing I have noticed in the last several days of handling, if I choke down, get my hand closer into that flare, like I would with, say, a disc pommel, or maybe even some of the more right angle pommels on Viking era swords. Um, gives me an extra inch and a half of reach on this thing. So it also moves the point of balance forward, but I'm, I'm gonna say that feels surprisingly good. So as I've worked with these, they've kind of taught me where to hold them. This one does feel good um, a little bit south 
of those guard hooks. So not right up on it, but not all the way down here. I just This one just seems to, to say, hold me like this about, well, maybe three quarters of an inch down on that side of my hand. Yeah, that just seems to be a good gripping point. We'll see how it does under more impact and cutting. This one tells me to hold it lower. Not all the way down, but, but pretty close. And when I do that, I just I feel like I have the ideal grip. Now, once I round the scales off, it might change. And I'll update you. I plan to do some rounding on the scales, some other fine tuning, find wherever the hell my target stand went to. We did some rearranging around here. Uh, it seems to have disappeared or, or been displaced by someone. Uh, I'll get outside when the weather's good. I'll do some cutting side by side so you can see them perform. And we shall revisit this topic. But for now, yeah, this, um, both of these, I found nice handy tools. And of course, the other big bonus about these things is I don't really have to worry about beating them up. So perfectly willing to go out and, and whack these into wood and more abusive targets to basically see how things go in some of my tests. So to be continued. Until that to be continued, as usual, thanks for watching, following, subscribing, liking the videos, commenting our conversation. If you have any questions about these or you have these or swords like these other APOC products, other tactical swords, let's get the conversation going. And then I hope to see you all back for, well, wherever this goes.